Yeah, well, I tried once before. Don't get quiet all at once. You can keep talking. <laughs> Good morning, Desert Chapel. Good morning. We've got a bunch of people back from vacation. We've got a bunch of people back from being away for the entire summer. And uh, we've got some, just so you won't forget how bad it is in the summer, we've got some hot days coming up here in the next few days. So. Um, announcements. Uh, we have got a lot of soap. Um, the community feast was gifted a pallet full of soap. So we have, back in the back, we have just a small amount of the soap to have. A bit, it's just, it's bath soap. Yeah, a little. So take all you want. Body soap. No dish soap, as far as I know. Uh, choir. Peggy's back. Choir begins on October 3rd, Thursday at 4. All right. So all of you singers, get in tune. Get ready to come to the, the choir on uh, practice on October. Whether you can sing or not. Well, we've proven that for years, haven't we? <laughs> you, don't have to be able to, you don't have to be able to sing to be in the choir. Uh, lay servant classes are going to be held here at Desert Chapel. Um, intro to, to lay ministry and public prayer on October 18th from 4 to 7 and October 19th from 8 until 4. There are flyers in the back of, with information about the classes and how to sign up. If you have any questions, see our pastor who will be participating in that, correct? Uh, rummage sale. We're having a rummage sale on uh, November 15th. Now that sounds like a long way away, but we're almost in October. So um, if you have things that you'd like to donate to the sale, uh, see Iris or Nancy, uh, bring them by the office. We'll, we'll make sure that they get in. Pardon? Oh, we'll pick up as well. All right. So, but you still have to let us know, right? Okay. Uh... All Church Conference will be held November 26th at 5 p.m. Everyone is encouraged to attend and meet our district superintendent and hear what is going on with the church. I might be able to hear some of that today if they were nosing around a bit. Okay. Pastor, any announcements nope. other than... Okay, Michael, if you'll lead us with music and the worship. Thank you.
Amazing grace, I once was blind, but now I see. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. Please stand, if you're able, and join us in the call to worship. Who is wise and understanding among us? Those who seek wisdom and understanding each and every day. Those who delight in God and meditate on God's law. Come, learn more about the wisdom from above. A wisdom that yields a harvest of righteousness. O oh God, your wisdom is more precious than jewels. We draw near to you. Amen. Please join in the opening hymn, Jesus United by Thy Grace. It's in the hymn book uh, 561, 561, and we'll sing verses 1 through 4. Let us pray. We draw near to you, God, O oh God, source of all understanding, and ask you to draw near to us. Teach us your wisdom from above, that we may bear good fruit in our lives. Root us beside the streams of your wisdom, that the green leaves of our goodness, fed by your insight, may not wither. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning, church family. Good morning. My name's Philip Tesarek. I'm the pastor here at Desert Chapel, and we are blessed that you are worshiping here with us in this beautiful sanctuary and with us online. And now is the time when we come together. We are a praying church. We come together to lift up the light of Christ and pray for our friends, our neighbors, our community, and those whom we may never meet. We are a praying church, and I encourage you to share your prayer concerns with the congregation. There are several ways to do that. One unique Desert Chapel way is to put a prayer request under prayer bear before service. You can also fill out a prayer request card and put it in the offering plate later in service. Or you can email the office at info at desertchapelumc. Org. As we come together today, we do have several continuing prayers. We are lifting up Traveling Mercies, prayers for safe travels for Rick and Greta as they will be traveling back from Kansas and joining us soon. We are blessed by several of our winter visitors who have returned this weekend just in time for some plus 100 temperatures this coming week. We continue to lift up praises that Thelma Harris has back with us after her uh, stint, uh, after, her, um, after her fun with her kneecap. We are so glad that Thelma is back with us. We continue to lift up prayers for the friends and family 
of Tank Wilson, who passed away on September 6th. We lift up prayers for Trina and her health concerns. We are praying for healing and medical discernment. We continue to pray for our friend Marilyn Schultz, who continues in cardiac rehab after her cardiac surgery. We are praying for a quick recovery and a soon return to us. We continue to pray for the little baby, James Lopez, who has been in the NICU. We've been praying for him and his parents that they continue to experience healing and growth and peace. We continue to pray for Bill Gowans, who has been waiting a, a very long time for a much needed hernia surgery. We continue to pray for Sally Steiner's daughter-in-law, who has been hospitalized. We continue to pray for Kathy's friend Arlene, who has been diagnosed with cancer in multiple areas. And we continue to pray for Greg, Peggy's son, who has been dealing with multiple medical issues and the pain from them. And we continue to lift up prayers for Lori Wilburn, who is the daughter of Jim Edwards, as she continues her battle with stage four non-smoker lung cancer. Let us bow our heads. Almighty and loving God, we come to you together in this community of faith amongst friends and family and new friends. We come to you together to lift up thanks for the breath that you've given us in the day ahead. We lift up thanks for the opportunity to pray and come together. And yet while we do, we have brought in with us concerns and fears and prayers for recovery. Lord, we lift up those families who are experiencing strife, pain, anger, trauma. We lift them up and pray for family reconciliation. And we know that is a hard road and a long road. And we pray for the peace and direction for each member of those families. We are lifting up prayers for the victims of violence. This last week saw shootings, violence in the Middle East, suffering. Lord, we do not understand sometimes the world that we live in. And yet we pray for ceasing of hostilities, healing of the wounded, and peace for the families of those who have lost loved ones. Lord, we lift up in prayer those who could not be with us today because they are in the hospital, in hospice, in care homes. They are ill at home. We miss them. We know that your love surrounds them. And yet we need an extra dose of health. We need comfort because we miss them and we want them to feel our love around them. So we ask for help that they feel the love that we send to them. Now let us lift up in silent prayer those prayers and concerns and fears that we brought in with us today deep in our hearts. O oh God, we live our lives as best we can, dealing with difficult relationships and situations, putting failures and disappointments behind us, and moving into each new day with as much energy, goodwill, and optimism as we can muster. But here, right now, we seldom have the right answers. We seldom seek your higher wisdom in our lives. We just move ahead. Forgive us for not asking for your insight. Fill us with your wisdom that we may live lives of goodness and peace. We lift this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us come together as confident children of Christ and let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading today is taken from James uh, chapter 3, verse 13 through chapter 4, uh, verse 3, 6, and 8. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Please stand for the hymn of reflection, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine. It's in the hymn book. 465. Thank you. Please be seated. I come from the great state of Texas, 
in which we have made bragging into a part of our culture. And my grandfather was an avid fisherman. We have pictures of him through the 1960s and 70s, pictures of him holding stringers of fish with his fishing buddies. He loved fishing for largemouth bass. And this was long before the days of digital photography, even longer before the days of artificial intelligence in photographic editing. I'm pretty sure the photos that we have of him and the fish are real. But today, today is different. We can use digital photographic editing tools now located on our phones to change just about anything. Do you want a bigger brag? How about we feed that photo of you and your little two-pound catfish? Let's feed that into the artificial intelligence machine, and voila, your small catfish has just turned into a 30-pound walleye. <laughs> Fish pictures will never be the same, and perhaps will never be believed again. Muhammad Ali was a world-class boxer, and it turned out he was a world-class boaster as well. He had some really epic lines. One of his quotes, I done wrestled with an alligator. I done tussled with a whale. I handcuffed lightning. I thrown thunder in jail. Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean that I made medicine sick. Another quote, if you even dream of beating me, you better wake up and apologize. <laughs> Another one, I am the greatest. I said that even before I knew I was. I figured that if I said it enough, I would convince the world that I really was the greatest. And last but not least, it's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. <laughs> now, to his credit, Muhammad Ali also said many inspirational and motivational things. He was really quotable, and he truly was motivational. Today we are in our third and final week of our journey through the epistle of James. In James chapters 3 and 4, we are hearing about the social sins, as some theologians call them, and boasting or bragging is one of them. In James chapter 2, we focused on the requirement to pair our faith in God with actions, real tangible acts that bring the light of Christ into the world. In other words, putting feet to prayers. Last week, we talked about the strong admonitions in chapter 3 about the power for both good and evil that our words can have. And today, James is putting those together and talking about our words and our actions in terms of our corporate or our community behavior. James was considered to be the brother of Jesus, and he was an early leader in the early Christian church in Jerusalem. Some believe that James wrote this epistle as a circular letter. In other words, it was meant to be circulated amongst the different Christian churches. It had theology lessons. It was essentially a collection of James's sermons. Now, James is a small five-chapter book. It's located toward the back of the New Testament, and it is considered a guidebook for righteous living. The Catholic priest, Reverend Martin Luther, who founded the Protestant Reformation, he didn't see much value early on in James because it didn't have any direct gospel teachings. In fact, Martin Luther called it an epistle of straw. But later in his life, he changed its, his mind about its value. The Reverend John Wesley from the Anglican Church in England in the 1700s who went on to found the Methodist movement that we are descendants of here today at Desert Chapel. Wesley found the epistle of James to be deeply useful and tightly woven into his theology. John Wesley was all about holy living, righteous living, and he focused his sermons and teachings around that. Wesley placed a great amount of emphasis on the epistle of James. In today's text, James is drawing a very distinct difference and a stark parallel between two sets of behaviors, the wisdom from heaven or the wisdom from below, or evil wisdom as he called it. James 
draws kind of an imaginary line down a page with two columns. And let's just say on the left side we have bitter envy, selfish ambition, boasting, and denying the truth. James calls these earthly or unspiritual, demonic. If you practice these behaviors, you will find disorder and evil practice. If we take a step back, this is essentially that if you do that, you're in a state of sin. The separation from self and God and from others, being out of relationship, out of sync, disconnected. Now on the right side of our imaginary page, we find peace-loving, consideration for others, submissive to God, full of mercy, having good fruit, being impartial, being sincere. James said that this wisdom is from God. It's from heaven. James says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, the Apostle Paul frequently preached about reaping what you sow. In his letter to the Galatians, he said in chapter 6, he said, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give it up. Okay, so what does that, what does our imaginary chart mean? On the left side, we we have behaviors that we probably agree are not good, but they're not always easy to avoid. Selfishness, ambition, envy. On the right side are behaviors that we all want. We we strive for them, but they're not always easy. Mercy, selflessness, and patience. What happens if we give in to our anger and our envy and our greed? James says that we will have quarreling, arguing, contention, strife, even war. In small groups, we won't get along. We won't be productive, and we sure won't be focused on following Christ. If we avoid these behaviors, if we put submission to God over submission to self, then we produce good fruit. That good fruit means a Christ-centered life in which peace reigns. Now, we're not talking about global peace, but peace in our lives and our interactions with other people. Peace that leaves spaces open to deliver love and discipleship to each other. It's pretty hard to do any of that when you spend all your time arguing. James in chapter 4 goes on to say this. It says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says, without reason, he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So James was addressing these texts to churches and church members. But the message, the meaning and the value go far beyond those circles. There was a lot of conflict in the early churches, and James was considered somewhat of a peacemaker between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile pagan Christians that Paul recruited. The early church was rife with disagreements over who should follow Judaic dietary and purity customs. Despite Paul trying to squash that over and over and over again, those debates and those arguments and many more still existed. Early Christians came from all kinds of backgrounds. The world wasn't really that different from ours today. Peace was priceless, it was hard to find, and it was even harder to maintain between groups that really should have been getting along. Now the dictionary gives us a definition for peace. According to Merriam-Webster, peace is a state of tranquility or quiet 
a state of security or order within a community provided for by law or custom. Peace is freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions. Peace is harmony in personal relations or a state, a period of mutual concord between governments. Yesterday was the International Day of Peace. The International Day of Peace was established in 1981 by the United Nations General Assembly with the intent to be a period of nonviolence and ceasefire. Now, when I heard about it, I couldn't help be reminded of the 2000 movie Miss Congeniality. <laughs> Anyone ever seen that movie? All right. It starred Sandra Bullock and Candace Bergen and William Shatner. And the premise was that a national beauty pageant was being threatened by a terrorist bomber. So the FBI placed an undercover agent, Sandra Bullock, into the pageant. Now, apparently part of these pageants, they ask the participants what they want most, what they want, their, what their dreams are. And they give some fluffy responses. But by the, at the end of every sentence, they say, and I want world peace. It's a pretty funny and light movie. We all want world peace, don't we? I have no idea how to achieve world peace. We have a long history of conflict and aggression. Countries wanting what other countries have. Leaders bragging and boasting. Egos taking front and center over good sense. Horrible things. Horrible things like genocide and ethnic cleansing. Our Old Testament scriptures are full of war and quarrels. But I do know this. Peace, real peace, starts with each one of us. You don't solve problems top down. You solve them from the ground up. Do we seek out arguments and conflicts with our neighbors? Or do we demonstrate compassion and active listening? Are we humble in large gatherings? Or are we boastful? Are we patient? Or are we eager to move on to the next conversation? I don't really know the foundations of how the International Day of Peace came about. I'm sure it had good intentions. But I do know that when people make a choice in their behaviors, and they start one by one with their relationships to change their outlook, their disposition, to tear down the bitterness, to put aside the envy, and resist the urge to step on others to move up, then real change happens. Reverend Carolyn Volantine said, encouraging the root of bitterness is always the foul fertilizer of unforgiveness. Refusal to forgive encourages many toxic weeds of interpersonal conflicts and sin. Bitter, prideful, negative emotions yield the fruits of disorder, and as James calls it, every evil thing. Sometimes I'm asked for my favorite scripture no matter how much I learn or how, many, how my biblical depth and breadth increases, the Beatitudes are my all-time favorite scripture. There are two versions, one in the Gospel of Matthew from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and another shorter version from the Gospel of Luke uh, called Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. Many believe them to be from the same event in Jesus' life and essentially the same sermon. From the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, and hear this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. I'm sure many of you have heard those, probably all your life. They resonate with me even in the darkest of times. And they really speak to James's text. These are Jesus's words, the foundation of the epistle. 
a guide to holy living there in the Beatitudes. And if only it were that easy. James's guidelines are what we call a stretch goal. Sometimes we really have to work hard and long to achieve it. We have to stretch ourselves to complete the task. But let's admit it, this is a difficult text. It's easier said than done. It can be interpreted in ways that could discourage good behaviors. It's tricky. You can be argumentative or quarrelsome. For some reason, my father's favorite word to describe this condition was obstreperous. It's a real word. Look it up. He loved it. You can argue for the sake of arguing, for the sake of obstruction, just, or just because you don't like the other person. But what are your motives? But we want people to speak up, defend their God-given rights, and call out evil in the world. We need solutions to really hard problems, and sometimes we need to hear ideas that are far-fetched without shooting them down. So we should not be discouraging of spirited conversations and unusual solutions. You can be boastful. You can brag and tell everyone your ideas and your family and your church or your business is far better than anyone else's. In worst cases, you could extend that into true narcissism. Who benefits? And who is harmed by your bragging? There's a difference in going up to people and saying, hey, I'd like to invite you to our church because we are a loving and prayerful and welcoming congregation. Or going up to them and saying, our church is better than your church. But we also have to encourage people to share their amazing, unique, God-given gifts with each other. Especially those who suffer from low self-esteem. This text should not be used to keep a foot on people who are meek or quiet or non-engaged. James is not encouraging low self-esteem by any means. I have talked to amazing people who think they have nothing to offer the world, and yet they have everything to offer the world because every day of the week they're offering love and invitation and grace to the people that they meet. Harold Singer says this, The righteous do not merely keep the peace which sometimes means failing to confront problems that should be addressed. Rather, they make peace, which may mean temporarily disrupting a community in order to deal with root problems so that genuine peace can ensue. James brings us to a crossroads, a choice that we have in our behaviors. Do we focus on ourselves and our petty likes, our dislikes and our hatreds? Or do we focus on humility and love for our neighbor? Our choice, when we get to that fork in the road, will determine whether we can have peace or whether we will have strife in our lives and the lives of those around us. I mean, James only talks about the easy stuff, right? We need recipe books, instruction manuals, build drawings, road maps. We need all that. There's a reason why the bookstores are full of those type of books. And there's a good reason why James resonates with us even today. It's a convicting text. Peace begins at home, with us, person by person, group by group. It's a tough road to walk. As Jesus said, we Christians are called to do the hard work. But that hard work leads to a good life. Careful, let's not confuse a good life with the good life. The good life is something different and a discussion for another time. We're called to live a good life. We are called to live a life in which when we leave this life, we leave with deep faith in God and the world is a better place for us having been there. That's holy living. Amen. I now invite our ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings.
God of love and mercy, we bring these offerings with grateful hearts, honoring your enduring guidance in our lives. Just as wisdom works with willing hands and provides for those in need, may these gifts be used to nurture and uplift our community. Inspire us to follow your teachings of kindness and generosity. Transform our contributions into acts of love and justice, spreading your light into the world. May we always give credit to your divine wisdom and grace. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for our final hymn, number 2158, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Amen. What a beautiful hymn. So Bev Wren has assured us that next week it will only be hot for two days, right? 105. Okay, we do have a little argument about 105 to 108, but we'll give Bev that kind of, because she's been right the last two weeks. So uh, all of you folks who we're seeing for the first time in a few months, welcome back to Desert Chapel. We are so glad that you are joining us again. Amen. Our lesson today is that the peace of Christ, and thus the peace in the world, begins with each of us, one by one, our actions, our thoughts, and our choices. So go forth and spread peace and the peace of Christ amongst your friends, family, community, and those you've never met. And as you go forth into that beautiful Arizona Sunday morning, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his countenance to turn toward you and be gracious to you, and may the Lord Make his face to shine upon you and bring you peace. Go forth. Amen.